since uh, for about uh, 12 years. Uh, moved out of the garage about six years ago in, into a place that's uh, I'm surrounded. Uh, a whole team of experts are, are here. We understand mason bees. We understand a lot about the leafcutter bee. Uh, it's important for us that um, everything we do has to be uh, thinking of the bee first and then kind of ease of use for the customers. Uh, we care about our bees. All of our products, they have to work or we're not going to sell it. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, information should be free. So what we have, we just share, whether in a presentation or online in our learn section, a lot of different places. And then we work with um, our peers. We work with our competitors. We work with researchers. Uh, we believe that through collaboration strongly, um, more food gets grown, more people understand about these gentle bees. And so we, we're, we care. So collaboration is really important to us. So kind of just diving right in, um, there's a lot of bee species out there, 21, 24,000, they still don't know, okay? The honeybee came across with the pilgrims, um, gosh, whenever that was, a um, long time ago, because there wasn't anything sweet on the East Coast. They didn't care about the pollination. In fact, they brought in the dandelion because there wasn't enough pollen on the East Coast. Uh, so. You know, that, that's what the honeybee is, a European bee. In North America, we've got a uh, thumb in the air, about 4,000 species of native bees. Now, a little bit further, okay, let's go a little bit deeper. Um, there are social bees. So think through honeybee, bumblebee, a social insect would be uh, termites or, um, you know, an ant nest. So social, one queen and everyone supports that queen. 90% of the bees are solitary, where every single female is a queen, okay? So when you actually look at the counts, there's about uh, seven species of honeybees in the world. And so out of the 21, 24,000, it is a small, small percentage of the bees. Now, granted, because it's the only bee in the world, uh, there's a lot of them raised. But the um, honeybee is the exception. The social bees are the exception. The solitary bees are really how these bees operate. And we'll get into um, a little bit about them. So uh, each bee, again, works alone. There's really no communication. There's, um, there's no hive to protect. Since every female is doing her own little nesting hole, whether in the ground or, or in a hole, she uh, doesn't really need to defend it. And so uh, if she does sting, you know, bees have stingers. If she does sting, the venom in that sting is um, almost like a mosquito bite. Uh, I worked with researchers years ago just trying to find out how many, um, can anyone get anaphylactic shock from a solitary bee? And there were no known cases. So it's a really, if you can get stung, it's not that big of a deal. Every female is a queen. She's fertile. She's doing everything. So she's going to mate it with the male. In fact, this is a great picture right here. These green eyes on this uh, leaf cutter, that's a male leaf cutter bee. And then black eyes are female. I took this a couple years ago on a um, squash plant in my yard. So she has mated. She's doing all of the gathering the nectar and the pollen. She's building her own nest. She's laying her own eggs. And um, because she's in one tight little space, she's got her pollen around her in a 300-foot radius, 100-meter radius. Um, she's maybe covering six acres. It's a very tight distance. And again, she's doing it all. Now, this lifespan of almost all the bees, including the social bees, in a honeybee hive, a, th a thousand eggs are laid a day, a thousand bees are dying a day. So the, the bee wings only flap so many times before they get frayed and they just pass on. So, so goes with the solitary bees as well. The eggs that they've laid this year are next year's bees. So they're kind of in and out. Some bees are um, the mason bee that we, we work with comes out early spring. The eggs it's laid are, you know, next year's bees. It's dead by maybe May or June. 
and those eggs are again are next year's things. And then there are other bees that show up um, mid mid May, mid June, late August. So each species has their own time of year. If there was pollen out there, you know, millennia ago, then there was a bee that worked to, you know, worked with that pollen and you know to move it around. And so there are bees then that show up at that time of year. We think that's a cool thing. So here's the question mark. Uh, Damaris, any questions uh, so far? Yes, we have one question about if we should be concerned about the Asian giant hornet. <laughs> okay, so I heard um, I in the Northwest, we'll talk, uh, there, there's a thing called Houdini fly. We, we found it, um, Crombie's found it, yeah about the exact same time that they said, hey, there's this Asian hornet. Um, that hornet uh, tends to uh, focus on a social structure. So they go focus on a whole honey beehive or a whole bumble beehive or something. So they can walk in and just kill everything and then gorge the whole, you know, the whole pile comes in and gorges on that social insect. So the solitary bees, hmm, not, not that big of a deal. We don't think it um, impacts them at all. At all. Okay, we have one relevant question to this slide. Um, so does a leafcutter bee take a year to hatch like the mason bees, or are there multiple generations in a season? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, yes, would be, the, would be the answer. Um, the eggs laid last year, we'll talk about the cycle in a second, um, uh, become larvae by the end of the year and their larvae are all through the winter and then develop soon. Um, but we do find that um, sometimes those eggs laid uh, immediately run into larvae and you can have a second or even a third season in a warm summer. So I think that kind of, um, now uh, we'll get to that slide a little later on, but that's, that's a great question. Anything else, Damaris? Uh, there is a question about the size difference between male and female bees, and I don't think that we actually have a slide about that. So if you could talk about that. The size of the bee is directly proportioned to how much pollen was gathered for that bee. And the females, as she's laying eggs, she knows whether she's going to fertilize that egg. She got the sperm from the male a while ago. She's now carrying it with her, and she, as she lays an egg, she chooses to fertilize it female, not fertilize it male. And uh, they tend to provide more pollen for the important females. So in general, the females are um, bigger and and or much bigger than the males. With the leaf cutters, eh, you know, they're they're close. I think the males are a little smaller. Good question. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about um, some differences. We we've already talked between what we know the honey bee and and this bee. So we've already said uh, the solitary bees are a lot more gentle. But understanding how the pollen's collected is probably the hugest piece to our company, and and um, where we think solitary bees provide more food. So looking at a honey bee. These guys have evolved to survive through the winter and they've got the honey provisions and they've got a thousand eggs laid a day, a thousand mounds of pollen are needed a day. So these 30,000, 60,000 bees are organized to get every grain of pollen back to the hive. And so they have a thing called a waggle dance. It's communicating. The angle of the dance kind of matches the angle of the sun. The length of the dance is how far to fly till you find that pollen source. So they communicate and send off uh, females in all directions to the, of the compass, but specifically there to gather the pollen. They hit that tree, they gather all the pollen, they come back to the hive, and then they know to go back to that same tree to make sure they're getting all the pollen from that tree and they can go five miles looking for sources of pollen. So they're super organized, very, very focused. They'll stay on that tree and not hit other trees until that one tree is finished and they'll go a long ways. Okay, to contrast that now 
uh, the solitary bees, mason, leaf cutter, very, very messy. They, oh, um, <laughs> the honey bee carries her pollen sticky on her hind legs. See that one right there, left hand side. Very, very, very sticky. Okay. So, um, the solitary bee, man, they're working by themselves. They're gathering pollen wherever they can. She's meandering through. She doesn't really know this this source. She's just meandering through a 300 foot radius um, in maybe 25, 30 minutes. And as she's hitting flower, next flower, next bush, next tree, she's not staying anywhere. And that dry pollen, not sticking in the hind legs, but that dry pollen is falling off everywhere. And so the solitary bee is really an excellent pollinator. So let's just let's understand this again. So here's a honeybee. This picture was taken, um, when we look at this, this was in Africa uh, earlier this year. And I think this is canola that the bee is flying to. But as this honeybee is gathering their pollen, you don't see anything back here on the abdomen or on the hairs. Before they've left that flower, they've got it sticky and it's on the hind legs. When I spoke with Dr. Eric Musson, UC Davis, ooh, a couple of years ago, maybe five or six, he said, Dave, this isn't pollen on the back of the legs. That's bee food. Okay. So these guys are wonderful pollen gatherers and wonderful pollen carriers. The solitary bee, fuzzy bodies. It's, it's dry. It's being packed in there. She's belly flopping her flowers. And so as she moves along, these bees are pollen spreaders. Really important. And actually, as we work, um, that's in a slide in a little bit, as we work with farmers, uh, whether it's on the mason or the leaf cutter side, we're far finding the farmers are finding significantly more pollination than with the standard honeybee. And I'm not, you know, we don't disrespect the honeybee dollar. It's an amazing insect. Honey, you can move it around. It's, it's, it's a wonderful stable. But there are other bees that can create significantly more yield if you bring them into your yard or into a farm. So questions, Damaris? Yes, we are getting a common question about if this webinar will be recorded and aired later. And I think it would be good to answer that question for everyone. Carl. Uh, the answer is yes, we are currently recording this webinar and we'll be posting it uh, on our YouTube, our Facebook and uh, on our blog posts on our website. And uh, everyone who has attended will also get a follow up email with links to those videos as well. Suffice this to say, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Anything else, Damaris? No, no the, all of the other questions will be answered um, as you go along. Okay, this is really important for us, uh, for you guys to understand. So now we're gonna talk about the leaf cutter bee. It's also known as the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. Uh, scientifically, it's megacali. Rotundata. It's a solitary bee, flies in the summer. It's a generalist. Um, some bees only go to one specific type of flower. And we know this to be an excellent cross pollinator. Uh, it's a, the one that we carry, a little lighter in color. They're going to overwinter as a larva. So in this um, late spring, as the temperatures get above 60 degrees, that starts cueing the bee to metamorphose into um, an adult bee. Uh, and then they're flying in warm weather. Um, I have these in my dad's porch in, in uh, Palm Desert, 110 degrees. The bees are doing just fine. Uh, some bees, as they're gathering their pollen, laying their egg, and then stealing that chamber with um, something, the spring mason bee that we carry uses clay. There are other bees that use chewed up leaf bits. There's bees that use resin. This bee, the summer um, alfalfa bee, uses cut up leaf bits and she folds them, cuts them, flies them back to her house. We'll show a picture in a bit. 
and then uh, cements that in with a little bit of saliva, and we'll finally cap it off using leaf bits. And again, she's just visiting all flowers. So um, why do we call this the alfalfa leaf cutter bee? Years ago, ooh, 40s, 1940s, maybe 1950s, um, the only bee that was used on alfalfa was the honeybee. It's the only bee we knew about. And um, when this flower trips, it smacks the, um, the um, oh gosh, the pistol, I think, bam, on the top of the um, bee's head. <laughs> Every time the flower opens, flower opens up, bam, onto the head of the bee. The honeybees don't like that. Okay, they don't. Whereas this leafcutter bee, um, they didn't mind. And back in the 50s, I talked with um, this guy, gentleman, he's maybe 90 now, um, was sitting on a fence someplace out in um, British Columbia or in Saskatchewan, I think, with these alfalfa fields. And his dad brought this European bee back. And he said, all right, son, here goes, you know, here goes money. And he released the bees. And he said that first year, the bees just kept on flying and didn't do anything. And so the next year, he's sitting on the fence again, maybe he's nine or 10, he said. And this time the bee came back and nested. And that was, you know, a long time ago. And since then, um, they realized that the way these bees spread pollen, wow, so much more seed comes out of these things because they're such good pollen spreaders that um, it's very, very rare nowadays uh, to find a honeybee field or have a honeybee in an alfalfa field. They are a wonderful, wonderful pollen spreader. So it saved the alfalfa seed production uh, years ago. We've also um, done experimentation. We were one of the first ones taking an alfalfa bee and putting them on some organic farms out there in Tennessee. And um, <laughs> one of the farmers complained, um, wow, we just keep on getting dried beans because we can't pick them fast enough. We have too many beans on our fields. Another farmer complained about too many uh, acorn squash. They couldn't pick them fast enough on their field and they got to be too big and then consumers didn't want to eat huge big acorn squash so they just had to lie there and rot on the field. Um, we've also learned that uh, sweet potatoes, for whatever reason, um, the, the world thinks that sweet potatoes don't need pollination at all to get the, the tubers. But when we put the uh, leafcutter bee on sweet potato fields down there in Nashville, the farmers were getting double or triple the yield. And so we're working with um, some North Carolina um, universities this summer later on to see if we can determine scientifically that the leafcutter bee does increase the yield for our sweet potatoes. So they're cool bees. So food production, anything out there, Damaris? No, um, these questions will be answered. The questions that we've been getting will be answered um, later on by other slides. So we can. Okay. Um, so simple, uh, where do these bees live? They live in bee houses. So hives are more social, honeybee, bumblebee hive. These are bee houses and we kind of call them colonies is our word. Uh, this bee is an opportunist. It finds holes, doesn't make them. And each female is choosing her own little hole to go back into, lay her eggs, seal that chamber, uh, you know, so pollen, egg, leaf bits. This is, uh, these bees are smaller. They prefer six millimeter, about a quarter inch, whereas the mason bees are an eight millimeter bee. There are other bees that use four millimeter, four millimeter holes. This one's kind of like a medium size hole, but they will not necessarily go into the larger mason bee holes. And very much when you look at these big things that are sold with bamboo, those holes are all, most always too big. So she claims her own hole. And the nice thing about um, uh, providing these holes, you're able to, um, once the bees are done, move them out of the way so the birds don't get to them. And uh, it's easy to supply more holes for your bees as they fill these things up. So inside the holes, your bee's gone back into the hole. She's laid a little you know, mound of pollen. Actually, what she does, she brings in leaf bits and uh, curls them, seals them with a little bit of saliva, 
and then we'll put pollen into that whole nectar, then lay an egg. And then she seals that little chamber with um, a, a firm bit of chewed up leaf bits a lot of times. So she works from the back. The back bees are typically females. The front bees are males. And then before she finishes, she sits there and makes just a whole bunch of tiny little discs about the size, each one glued in. I pulled that little protective cap apart one time and counted 60 little leaf bits from there. Um, surprisingly, I've gone into my yard. I have um, thousands of these bees flying in my yard. And I can't see where they're getting their leaf bits from. So uh, two years ago, I found a hosta plant had a little bit of uh, leaf cut from it. But in general, uh, these bees are gathering their leaves from maybe my neighbor's yard. I don't know, not not mine. <laughs> so it's a very, um, very low impacting um, insect. Okay, so we have a couple of questions about if they, if the bee raiser has both eight millimeter and six millimeter size nesting holes in the bee house at the same time, will the bees share the house? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, in general, holes are far apart in, in nature. And when you put them all together, you know, the bees will find the right size hole. Uh, we do find that uh, the, sometimes the mason bees will go in and use a six millimeter hole. So they're earlier in the year. So the mason bee's done her work and she finishes maybe, I don't know, halfway down the hole. And so uh, a leaf cutter bee doesn't recognize that anyone's in there. She's got a shorter hole. She lays her uh, leaf bits now on the front half of that hole. And uh, it gets a little confusing. Next spring, when the mason bees come out, they just chew right through and kill every leaf cutter bee that was left in front of them. So we recommend that um, you know the bee that you're trying to have, that you're trying to raise, and have just those nesting holes in front of that bee. If you do have them together, it just is, and, and you'll recognize which bees have leaf on the ends, which have um, something else. We, that, we really recommend. Well, yes, we really recommend that as soon as your mason bees are done nesting, because they only make one generation per year, that you remove the mason bee nesting materials because those are too large for the litter bees anyway. And then set out only your smaller six millimeter size nesting holes for the leaf cutter bees because the way that they live and behave is a little different than the mason bees. Your life will be a little easier if you remove your mason bee nesting materials and then add your leaf cutter nesting materials to your bee house. Perfect. I agree. I agree. Next one. Um, I guess we could just point out that um, some our bee raising tips are included in our bee mail newsletter and we will explain how to do all of these steps in the newsletter every month where we remind you when to remove the mason bee nesting materials and when to start raising leaf cutter bees, when to harvest and when to set the cocoons out. All of the steps are included in our um, monthly bee mail newsletter. At the bottom of every one of our web pages in crownbees.com, you'll just find a little um, bottom right hand side, you'll see a little something that says bee mail, a little field. Just put your email inside there and you're signed up. Okay, and um, about the nesting materials, people have been asking how long the nesting nesting holes are. The bigger the bee, the longer the hole um, should be. Uh, mason bees have are in it at six inches. Um, I we're a firm believer. We know um, I'm going to say six inches is where we think is about right. Uh, the industry, the leafcutter bee industry, has used four inches at times. But the shallower the hole, the less females there are inside the hole because the bees know that uh, birds can attack from the front side. So that's why males are on the outside of the hole. And if, they, if your uh, holes are too short, they're going to put a female on the back end and go mostly males. But if they're long, you'll have a lot of females 
and then a lot of males. So I, we would say longer than four inches up to six. Okay, I think it's a good time to move on. Okay, okay now specifically, let's actually dive in. How are you successful? Again, let's understand um, what happens. So in the summer, the bees are going to be developing. You can incubate them yourself if you're in a cool country, and you can you can we'll talk about that next slide. So the bees develop. They're going to merge. The males are going to merge first. They're going to be um, gathering pollen. So they made it with the males. The males are dead after a couple weeks. Uh, the females are gathering their pollen, laying their eggs, building their whole nests. Uh, once she's done maybe doing two complete holes, she's dead. The larva or the, the eggs hatch. You've got a few little stages as uh, larva goes from tiny little something to um, uh, maybe a little smaller than a piece of um, a grain of rice uh, through the summer. And then it just stays there and hibernates for the winter and then uses the warmer late spring early summer temperatures to metamorphose from you know larva to bee um if you're going to be doing this well so let me just say this in different words here um if you're going to incubate your cocoons and you're going to do this yourself you're going to be thinking through four to six weeks before you want those bees to be out there meaning you can choose to put your bees out in may or you can keep them in a cool space, a refrigerator, for example, and have them come out in uh, late August or September for pumpkins. You're able to choose when you want your bees out. If you're buying them from us, uh, Crown Bees is already incubating these cocoons and we're actually just sending you live bees through the mail. Okay, you're letting your bees out, warm temperatures, um, you're watching the bees do their thing. They're really just fun little bees and they'll use the holes and that's kind of wherever we're at in the summer they're doing that. Um, when your bees are finished, I will tell you in bee mail, take them out, protect them. We'll show you how to do that. And then you're storing your cocoons through the winter and next spring, early summer, you're going to be harvesting your cocoons. And again, we teach that with videos. We we want you successful. So we'll tell you about that in email. Okay, so uh, what are the holes? Uh, it's, we have learned that when you have um, holes that can't open up like bamboo or drill blocks of wood, uh, pests move into that. And we'll talk a little bit later on, but pests move into those types of holes and stay there. And we are always looking for healthy bees. So holes that can be um, opened up. So reeds can be cracked. Paper tubes can be unwound. Wood trays can be opened up. So the right length, you get more um, female-male ratios. Uh, plastic doesn't breathe. And uh, this pollen moist is loaf. And, or, and this pollen loaf is moist. And natural material wicks pollen away and plastic just doesn't and then we want you to be able to open these things so avoid um too large so quarter inch is a small size hole larger that's not helpful too short not that good bamboo is not a good material there's a lot of product out there being sold in big stores bamboo is not good for um good bee health and then uh, drill blocks of wood. There's a lot of websites saying, hey, look, just drill your own holes. Um, while that's done, uh, the bees will naturally have um, found holes in the side of your house, into trees. Um, those holes are typically far apart in nature and pests can't walk from one to the other. And so if you put them all together, your pests are all together too. And this is why we want you to be able to open things up. Okay, so questions here would be whole design questions.
first. I, yeah, I was trying to catch up and read all of the questions because we're getting a lot. Um, so I don't see. There's one question about if you could have existing eight millimeter tubes and then if you could line them somehow to make them smaller into a six millimeter tube. That, that I would for me. guess that, that would be a lot of work. I mean, you could try it. I don't know if the bees will nest in there. Um, but uh, no, I, no other questions experiment. about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we have done that. If you were to take parchment paper and maybe wrap it around a um, coat hanger, two or three wraps, and then push that inside there, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's it's a. There's always the DIY. You don't have to buy everything from us. Okay, I don't see any other nesting materials questions. Okay. So here's actually, um, these are leaf cutters just flying. See the little pieces of leaves they're carrying with? So the leaves that they're looking for um, are able, they're able to cut. So think through uh, bean leaves, strawberries, roses, lilacs, hosta, uh, not super thick, not too thin, not too flimsy. Um, your uh, squash plants typically are too fuzzy. And, and we've learned plants are built to handle um, little cuts out of them. So this type of, uh, you wanna make sure that you have these flowers in a six acre radius or site flower plants in a six acre radius before you're gonna have your bees show up. Okay, so how to start. Uh, again, some are bee, okay. You are choosing when you want them to pollinate. Okay, so if you're focusing on early spring and it's peas or a little later on with beans or further on with pumpkins, you're choosing when you want these bees there. If you're going to purchase them, um, you're able to choose a, a bee ship date. So we always ship our bees on Mondays. You just plan ahead. I think I want to have my bees shipped to me on uh, July 12th. And you can change your dates. We're, we're real easy with that. Uh, but you choose. Okay. If you're incubating your bees, you need to plan ahead. So with incubation, let's just say we're now looking at um, March or April. And you want to have your bees flying um, late May. So you're thinking ahead. The bees need about um, well, a certain amount of, of BTUs that are out there. We know that at 84 degrees, it takes about three weeks. If you were putting these bees in a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a warm room in your house, like where you've got your hot water heater, it might take four or five weeks. Okay, you've got your bees in a little bag. This is our um, either, either our bee guard or we had cocoon bags. Uh, you're able to see the cocoons through there. And at about two to three weeks, there's a um, there's a little wasp that comes out. It's you'll see it looks like a gnat size. Just squish that. That's uh, it's terramalis, and it it just is across the nation. It's everywhere. So we know that comes out when we're over here at Crown Bees. We were able to get rid of that bee easily or the wasp easily. When the first male emerges, remember they've got the green eyes. So the first bees that have green eyes, that's the male. Just wait a couple more days and then take all of the cocoons. That means everyone's almost right there and move them um, outside into your bee house. Females will kind of follow right there. So we'll show you where to put them uh, in a second. So the bee house. Super easy. It's just facing morning sun. If it's super hot around you, I might look for afternoon shade. If if it's you know if it's going to be up there in the um, 90s and 100s, you could bake these larvae, and so to have a little shady would be good. Head height. If you're super tall, have it that size. If you're super short, put it down there. The reason is, eh, you just want to see what's going on. Again, smaller holes, and you know you. You're putting this thing out when you've got pollen and the temps are a little warmer. Okay, so let's talk through incubation questions and um, putting out the bee house questions. Um, 
We have so many questions to look through. Um, okay. Let's see. So, will the male bees be okay in the bag for a few days? Yes. Simple answer. They they um, they develop with their stored fats right away, and so they can last in that bag. I just talked with Dr. Um, Teresa Pitzinger uh, Monday about a similar topic, and she said, "Oh gosh, Dave, if these bees came out too early, or for example, we ship them to somebody and it's raining when the bees are there, and what do I do with these emerged bees?" She said, "You know, just what you do with the mason bees. Uh, give them a little sponge or cotton ball." with 50-50 uh, water, white white sugar and, and water, put that in there with the bees and the bees can survive on that for uh, for weeks. No big deal. Okay. Um, we did have some questions about um, attracting the bees to the bee house and um, you, we do have an invite a bee spray for leaf cutter bees that um, and helps make your bee house smell like other bees have nested there before. And we do have a question about if if someone can move their bee house mid-season. Uh, we have, our research shows that when you put uh, a house in you know one spot and then move it two or three weeks later, that the bees, um, they had that spot, exact spot memorized. And so, uh, a moving house isn't any place they want to go, and most of the bees will leave that house after you moved it. So, no would be the right answer. Okay, one more question. How many flowers do we need to support the bees? That's a great question. Um, science is telling us about a square yard, a square meter of flowers per day supports one bee. Now these bees are flying in a six acre radius. So, you know, that's a lot of, that's, you typically have a lot of flowers in that area. So the the harder part would maybe be out there in a deserty environment where there's a little less, but six acres is a lot of space. Okay, we, okay, we can move on. Okay, putting the bees out. Um, whether you've incubated the bees or you've bought them from us, you're going to get a little bag full of uh, squiggly bees and some cocoons. Um, it'll be a mix, 50, 50, 25, 75. They're, they're squiggling. Um, if you've got them from us and they came in the mail, put the bag in a refrigerator for about 15 minutes. Then go open it up and there's instructions inside there. We have all the instructions of what to do in there. Okay. But you've got these, you've pulled out of the fridge now. You've got your own little bag. You're going to put it, like in our top attic, we have a little cocoon drawer. Uh, we've got the bee hatchery here where the you're just putting the cocoons in there or the live bees, seal that up. And this is, your bees are going um, just next to your holes. Uh, you There's nothing magical about our cocoon hatchery, but you can put this bag just kind of pushed back underneath there and if you've got some uh some house with only holes maybe you could tape the bag underneath it uh, what we've learned though these bees aren't real smart um if this bag is turned sideways it's 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 an organza bag uh the bees will just hit the side of the bag and just stare at you and die so make sure that there's an opening facing out that the bees will naturally want to crawl through if it is super hot, okay, I means above the 90s, um, take your take the bees uh, inside where it's a little cooler, and as they come out, um, just take you know so you've sealed this bag back up. Uh, just doing a mic check. Dave, are you there?
It looks, I don't hear him either, Carl, and his uh, video is paused. All right, well, we'll just give him a, a few uh, seconds here to reconnect, and then we'll pick it back up again. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to point out that the leafcutter bees, when they arrive to your house, they we ship them. Um, they are ready to start flying as soon as they arrive, and it's best for you to set the bees into the bee house as soon as they um, arrive at your house. And we can't feed the bees with um, a nectar or pollen source. Um, we can't store the bees in the fridge. They, they really need to go outside as, as soon as they arrive. It uh, looks like Dave is just reconnecting right now. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, we, I also see that we've had a couple of questions about providing water sources for bees. Um, this is a common practice to support honeybees who need the water in the summer to help um, to add it back to their honey so that they can feed from their honey sources. But because solitary bees don't make honey, they don't really need a water source provided for them. So as long as you have plenty of flowers in your yard, you should be able to raise um, leaf cutter bees. It looks like you've got time for uh, another question or two as, uh, okay. as Dave gets his mic yeah. ordered. <laughs> I'm trying to find some good relevant questions for, let's see. And if we really recommend harvesting your leaf cutter cocoons that you raise, um, it will help you control some of the pests that leaf cutter bees have. It will also help you um, to be able to control for incubation if you'd like to do that so that you can set your bees out um, when your garden is starting to bloom. Sorry, every time there's a new question brought up, I, it makes it really hard for me to read <laughs> what, I, what I'm trying to skim through here. Oh yes, we've also had questions, of, um, some questions about what kind of flowers you can add to help raise the bees. Um, Native flowers are more attractive to bees. Um, and flowers that have a nice open structure like um, daisies or asters, um, plants in the aster or sunflower family um, tend to be really attractive to bees. I currently have um, showy fleabane in my yard that every time I go out to look at it, it's covered in bumblebees or wild leaf cutter bees. Um, and if you're concerned about the leaves that the leaf cutter bees are harvesting, something that you can do to provide leaves and flowers is to plant peas or beans, which are really easy to grow. Um, another good plant to add to your garden is strawberry. We've um, heard in the last couple of years that leafcutter bees gather from strawberries. You do wanna make sure that you pick a variety that doesn't have all of the hairs on the, on the leaf surface. Um, leafcutter bees do harvest from roses, um, but they're, they're, they don't cause damage to the plants because they are only gathering from um, plants that have deciduous leaves that will regrow the, those same leaves again later. I'm sorry, we're still waiting for Dave to come back online. Well, he's, he's uh, connected right now and he's just about to share his screen. Okay. All right. 
And when you are releasing your leaf cutter bees, um, you just open the bag and put it on top of your nesting materials. Um, and your leaf cutter bees will arrive with a care sheet that explains how to put the cocoons into your bee house. Well, it looks like Dave's having some technical problems getting connected. Damaris, would you mind uh, uh, bringing up the presentation and continuing where he left off? Okay, let me find it. Uh, do you remember what slide we were on? I was kind of trying to read the... <laughs> Let's see where we were. Okay. The second. Oops. <laughs> One second. Yeah, I just talked to Dave and it looks like he can't get it, he can't get it up either. Okay. All right. Now now I've got it. Slip. Looking good. I can't see the presentation. <laughs> Hold on. Now I can't see myself. Um Okay, can you see the presentation now? Yep, yep, we're, looks great, looks great. Okay, all right, so I think that we left off here. Did, I think he went through this whole slide. Yes, yep, we're about to move past this one. Okay, all right. And I also, I cannot see the questions now, <laughs> but I know we had a lot, um, hopefully we covered them. So after you release the leaf cutter bees, the next step, that you do is called waiting and, and watching for leaf cutter bee activity. And the leaf cutter bees will build their nests throughout the summer and all the way until early fall. You can have a second generation of bees that will emerge during the um, early to mid or even late summer. And the second generation bees will leave large holes in the front of their nesting materials. Um, you can see in this picture, there are a couple of spots that look like leafcutter bees may have emerged. So because leafcutter bees are able to produce a second or third generation of bees, you want to leave your nesting materials out all summer so that the second generation bees can emerge from their nesting materials. We get a lot of questions about how to protect our bee house from birds and ants. And for birds, you can install our bee guard. Um, you wanna install this when you get your bee house set up because um, it could be a little confusing for the bees if the look of their house has changed after they've been nesting. Um, so it's, it's better if you can install this right after you get your nesting materials um, out and you install your cocoons or set out your cocoons. And then um, for ants, we have a product called Ant Cant. It's a kit that comes with a smooth tape and a non-toxic coating that makes that tape slippery so that the ants can't walk across this barrier. Um, and you can install this tape along the bottom of your bee house so that the bees, I mean, sorry, so that the ants can't walk across and get into your, into your bee house. Um, do we have any questions? Um, I do not see any questions here regarding uh, uh, pests and uh, okay. 
birds and ants. So yeah, I think we can move okay. move on. Okay. So because you are leaving your nesting materials out over summer, your bee house is probably going to be attractive to guests other than the leafcutter bees that you're raising. And um, there are summertime hole nesting bees that are looking for six millimeter size holes. There are also solitary wasps that nest in holes and they are beneficial insects who hunt garden pests. We've got um, pictures of um, some of the really popular hole nesting or common, uh, popular and well-known. <laughs> the top picture is of the grass carrying wasp. And then the picture below that of, is of a potter wasp bringing a caterpillar back to the nest. And each hole nesting wasp species has their favorite kind of prey that they like to hunt. Um, some of them like crickets, some even like spiders, um, and then caterpillars or um, yeah, other insects. And so the picture on the right is um, of various cocoons that we've found um, from our customers when they are raising bees. So when you harvest your cocoons, next spring, you might find um, interesting um, bee hotel guests. And what you can do is set aside those cocoons in their own little um, uh, organza bag, like our cocoon guard bag, and incubate them just like you do with your, your summer leaf cutter bees. And you can take some notes about when they start to emerge. And they're really interesting. They're a lot of fun to watch too. Um, a lot of people ask if these wasps are good or bad. And I like to say that they are good. They are helping to balance the pest population in your garden so that you don't have to use chemicals or, or do anything special with them. So do we have any questions about uh, summertime activity? Well, we do have a lot of questions, but we are ending, uh, coming up to the our, our yeah. ending time. Um, okay. So I'd just like to remind everyone that um, we do have uh, several hundred questions in queue and we do uh, try to reply to everyone after the webinar. So if we didn't get to your question live, um, then you can expect an email from us um, shortly after the webinar. Okay. All right, so after the bees are done nesting in the, um, early fall, you want to remove your, that is when you remove your summer leafcutter bee nesting materials because the hibernating leafcutter larva can attract predators. So you will remove your nesting materials in the fall when your daytime weather starts to fall below 60 degrees. And you can protect the filled nesting materials inside of our bee guard bag. And you want to follow natural temperatures by storing your, your filled nesting materials in an unheated garage or shed and throughout the fall and winter until you start your spring harvest. And because the leafcutter bee cocoons are not waterproof, um, we want you to avoid winter storage in your fridge because um, Storage in your fridge can cause um, mold issues and mold comes from natural sources like food. So we can't wash the cocoons, so we want you to store your nesting materials in your garage or shed. And here are the reasons why we, we are asking you to harvest your cocoons in the spring. Terra malis is a gnat-sized parasitic wasp and they use their long, um, egg layer that you can see it um, here in this close-up to pierce through the leafcutter cocoons. Um, and when you harvest the cocoons, you can control for those uh, parasitic wasps during incubation. So harvesting also lets you take inventory of how many cocoons you raised. Um, and you can separate and manage any of those wild cocoons that you may have found. And then you can get ready for incubating your leaf cutter cocoons. And I, I think um, we're gonna have to skip through 
the questions because we need to end on time. Um, we'd like you to sign up for Bmail. It's free. Um, we give you monthly tips and reminders for how to raise the bees. We also, um, that's where we announce some news and discounts or sales. And then um, there will be detailed steps for raising the bees. Um, signing up is free and easy. And, and then um, we have a lot of great resources. Our website, crownbees.com is full of information on our, the learn tab of our website has all of the bee raising steps. So you can read through that and kind of see what's what's coming up. We have a lot of how-to YouTube videos. Um, we are active on our Facebook page. And if you're local, we have a Mason Bee Harvest Party in October. And so that's it. Thank you for joining. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you all for, for coming. And again, uh, we will be uh, posting a recording of this webinar, uh, most likely by the end of the day or first thing tomorrow morning to our Facebook, YouTube, and on our website. So uh, check it out if you missed anything um, and feel free to uh, contact us via our website if you have any other questions after the webinar. Okay, so thanks everybody.